And good morning from our Fox 9 at Streaming Center. I am Paul Bloom. You've been watching our gavel to gavel coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial in Hudson, Wisconsin. We've hit 1015. The judge taking a quick break. A lot to unpack there as we've now just watched, uh, uh, by my count, just under an hour, a jailhouse interrogation uh, with Nikolai Miu, Lieutenant Brandy Hart. Um, much of that quoted in uh, the criminal complaint uh, that the district attorney filed uh, against uh, Miu in the immediate aftermath of the deadly stabbing, charging Mr. Miu with one count of intentional first degree homicide, four counts of, excuse me, one count of intentional homicide, four counts of attempted homicide. I do want to get some assistance in dissecting what we just saw with local criminal defense attorney Eric Nelson. Eric is joining us. The reason why we really appreciate having Eric on. About a decade ago, Eric had a similar uh, self-defense uh, deadly uh, murder claim that uh, uh, he won uh, successfully. Uh, his client acquitted at that point a decade ago, Levi Aker Kendall. Um, obviously not uh, completely similar circumstances, but something close. So with the, given the charges and, and the nature and a riverfront confrontation, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. I know you were in and out of court this morning, so you haven't seen all of all of that interrogation. So let me get you caught up first. I want your opinion on the rights that were asserted at the beginning of this interrogation. Uh, the defense had tried to get this whole entire interview tossed out saying their client wanted a lawyer and wasn't granted one. I want to play you the critical portion, come back to you and get your take on it. Really? Yeah, well, I have bigger dreams now, yeah. shattered, but anyway, I don't want to talk about them right now. Okay. I don't know exactly what happened, I just don't, I, I can't talk about it. I need to go one step at a time. Yep, and if you have any questions along the way, Nick, yes. just stop and ask me, okay? Or if you need to take a break, just... How bad is it? Well, can we get through this form and ask <laughs> okay. each other yeah. questions? Yeah. I just, I don't want to, I want to maintain the integrity of yeah. this All investigation right. and your rights and, you know, so I want to get through this form and then yes. we can ask questions, okay? So I'm going to turn this around. Um, I'll give you this pen. What I'll have you do is I'm going to read each. Uh, you, you seem to speak excellent English. Yeah. You can read. Yeah, and I Miranda, imagine. Miranda writes, yeah. Yeah, which have not been read to me when I was put in the car. And, right? and that's okay, as long as they weren't asking you any questions, they don't need to. Oh. But I'd like to ask these questions, so that's why we're going to go through this right now, right. okay? So I'll let you have that pen, and so I'm going to read these to you, okay? Mm -hmm. You have the right to remain silent. Okay. Or just be... Uh, uh, you can check mark it, or some people put their initials. You know, we'll have you sign it at the bottom, so that, well, however you want to do that. Anything you say can be used against you in court or other proceedings. You have the right to consult an attorney before making any statement or answering any question, and you may have him or her present with you during questioning. Okay. And also, what, what, stop me, I, I yeah, talk kind of fast. Yeah, I was okay. going to ask you about this one. Okay. So, yep. how, when do I see one? When do I get one assigned to me? You would get one assigned to you the, or the soonest uh, would be on Monday. Oh. So that would be the, the soonest. Um, and working hours, working hours, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Is yeah. how that works. Okay. So if you cannot afford to pay for an attorney, you may be eligible to be represented by an attorney from the office of the state public defender. If you desire an attorney from that office, you should contact their local office. And and that information would be provided to me, or yes. Um, so what happens is uh, they we actually the jail provides that information every day to the public defender's office, like here she was on the list. Okay. So some people come into jail and they uh, either have a lawyer mm -hmm. already because of other things or they know a lawyer or mm -hmm. th they're going to find their own. So right. these guys will let you use the phone if that's... If I'll that's ask Candy to look for me okay. that's okay. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to see you and talk yeah. to you. Yeah, nope, that's fine. If you decide to answer questions now with or without an attorney, you still have the right to stop the questioning at any time or stop the questioning for the purpose of consulting an attorney. Yeah, I'd like to do it at, at some point. Okay. You can just check mark that. We went over that. However, you may waive the right to remain silent and you may answer questions now without an attorney. You can just check mark that I read that to you. You're not agreeing to anything right now. This is just that I, that I stated these things to you. So this says, the above rights have been read to me. 
I have initialed each paragraph, or in your case, check mark, to show that I understand each of my rights. I have received a copy of this form. So you sign it, and then I'm going to sign it, Nick, and then I'm going to give you a copy of it. All right, you heard it right there, Eric. When do I get to see an attorney? When do I get one assigned? Uh, he's told during working hours. This is a weekend. He expects it maybe Monday morning. And then he tells the lieutenant there, I'd like to do that, meaning meet with an attorney at some point. Uh, just again, your quick reaction to everything you just saw there. Yeah, I mean, anytime someone requests an attorney uh, or makes any sort of equivocal request for an attorney, the police have an obligation to clarify and determine whether they want that attorney now or what their intentions are. Um, I think that in this particular case, case it's a pretty close call. Uh, here in this situation, you had him say he wants to speak to an attorney at some point. When an, a, a person makes an unequivocal, I want a lawyer type of statement, then all questioning has to cease. At this point, it doesn't appear that Mr. Mew made such a, a demand or an unequivocal request for a lawyer. There's some hemming and hawing. Uh, I'll do it in the future. Uh, and it also sounds like he received a little bit of bad information from uh, the detective or the lieutenant in this case, because there are lawyers on call and available, even from the state public defender's office all day long, every day. How damaging is this? Is this uh, the lies, the storytelling? Is it repairable once he takes the stand? And, we, and it could happen as soon as this afternoon. He could be up next. We expect the state to rest. But is this repairable testimony or is, is he sunk? No, I mean, this, this highlights a couple of things. Number one, it highlights the absolute importance of the video that was uh, has been played and dissected and uh, you know, broken down into individual frames. Uh, so it's going to highlight the importance of that. But his testimony is going to be 100% critical. Uh, the, the lawyers, his lawyers have done an excellent job kind of setting up the setting up the defense and dismantling some of the claims using the video. This is a big blow to them. The lies are a big blow. His testimony is going to be absolutely critical uh, to kind of explain what is going on in his mind at that point and to explain why he lied. That's going to be equally as important, uh, what he what was going through. Again, the law in Wisconsin clearly indicates that at the time the defense, you know, the, the use of force occurs, you have to look at it from his perspective in that moment. And that's the critical piece. So he's going to be able to add that. He's already made some statements such as, you know, he feared for his life, but he's going to have to address these lies and the jury's going to have to get past it using that video kind of as we talked about on day one which is you know the video will go a long way to excuse some of the inconsistencies not only in you know the the other witnesses and the victim state accounts but also in his account he's gonna have to take ownership of that. let me go back to a moment in that interrogation eric he's asked did you have a knife and says no let's listen i'll get your uh response on the back end okay um did you have a knife no, no, absolutely. Okay. I had one earlier that I used to cut, but right at the beginning, and I left it on on the in the. I, I don't even know what I, what I did with it. I think I either gave it to one of the people, or I put it back in my truck. Okay. Yeah. So it may have been. I don't. I tell you the truth. I don't even know. And that was so, after you cut the string? Yeah, we needed to uh, have a, something to cut the string over there. They don't have any nuts. So. But you have them with you today, right? The what? A knife to cut. How did that? I think it's in my car. Okay. Yeah. I think did you drive or did Sandy drive? I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I don't even know uh, where it's at, that the truth. Uh, it may be in one of the bags we had with us. It may have been in, in um, I, I don't know. It may be I left it, put it back in the car. Because I went back with a bunch of, I had ra uh, uh, straps. I didn't want to pay for string. 
And again, Eric, you're there listening to uh, the recorded test uh, interrogation of Nikolai Miu, July 30, 2022, just a few hours later. He, at this point, does not know anybody is dead. He does not know there's video or photographs of him on that river. And you hear him say, I didn't have a knife. Maybe I left it back in the car, uh, maybe in a bag. I had it earlier today, but certainly not in the moment of the attack. Um, unfortunately, I'm not even going to get to my question because Judge Waterman is back on the bench. Will you stick around, come back at lunch, and we'll, uh, we'll have you... To dissect some more of this interrogation with us at that point. Thank you. And uh, in the meantime, we'll get back into court for the cross. -exam. And good morning again from the Fox 9 streaming studios. You, of course, are watching our gavel to gavel coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial from Hudson, uh, Wisconsin. We have reached an absolutely critical stage in this trial. The state has rested its case. You just listened there. The defense had moved to dismiss the attempted murder charges against uh, 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 Nikolai Miu is facing for the stabbings of what I would describe as the three lesser injured, though Riley Matson did suffer um, some horrible, horrible injuries from the knife wound that day. But uh, Riley Matson and the two Carlson brothers, Tony and uh, Dante, the judge denying the motion to dismiss those counts. So those counts continue right now. And then in that last moment there, Aaron Nelson, defense attorney, confirming Nikolai Miu is up. This is the defense case. My understanding is he is their last and final and only witness to go today. We've taken a couple of their witnesses out of turn. Nikolai Miu spending these few minutes during this recess getting ready to take the stand. And I could not think of uh, another attorney I would want to bring in right now uh, to get some uh, uh, thoughts from. This is Eric Nelson. We've introduced him several times during this trial. Eric represented a young man in Wisconsin about a decade ago, self-defense claim, knife attack uh, along uh, the St. Croix River in Wisconsin and uh, won an acquittal there where his defendant got up on the, uh, the stand, uh, Levi Aker Kendall, and told his story. And the jury eventually found uh, Mr. Aker Kendall not guilty. Eric, Nikolai Mew now just minutes away uh, from testifying. What is going on between him and his attorneys during this five-minute recess? Right now, they're just making sure that uh, Mr. Mew does fully intend to testify. They're going to have to go through a colloquy. Uh, which is just making sure that he understands all of his rights, his right to remain silent, the fact that he uh, you know, can testify if he chooses, and if he chooses to testify, he'll be subject to cross-examination. So I think what we'll see when the court uh, reconvenes is that Mr. Nelson, Aaron Nelson, will go through the rights that Mr. Mew has, and Mr. Mew will have to make a formal waiver of those rights. Uh, the uh, that's what they're just discussing kind of last minute. Are you sure you want to do this and and discussing the strategy and, and the importance of his testimony? And of course, I may be jumping a gun just a tad, but the defense did say during openings he was going to testify. The jury was out of the room there. I do want to point out there is still a last minute. You know, if he gets cold feet, they don't think it's right. But coming out of that damaging you know interrogation where he's making up stories and lying and misleading uh, the investigator someone has to clean that up is it the right call to put me you on the stand right now i think it's the only call that they can really make um at this point uh short of short of him not testifying i mean again we got to get inside of his mind we have to know what he was thinking that day as well as during that statement so it's going to be an important decision of course it is mr Mew's decision it's not his lawyer's decision it's his decision and he's got to be the one to make it two years he's waited to tell this story um, I know we've spoken about how, at least if not in these five minutes, they're not certainly, you know, putting pressure on him, pretending to do cross-examination at this point. That's all been done. Could you just describe how perhaps uh, the attorneys may be working with a client like this over the last couple of weeks? Uh, he's been in jail. He's been locked up for nearly two years. We don't know, you know, how he's doing mentally. Obviously, we can just see physically he's lost a lot of weight. He's lost a lot of color uh, from what we've seen uh, from, from the day of the stabbing. But what has the last few days or maybe the buildup? Have they been meeting after hours to, to, to practice, to talk about this, to, to go over certain questions? I would venture the the vast majority of that was done prior to the trial, uh, where they have reviewed evidence with their client. They've talked about uh, the types of questions they've likely done, mock cross examinations, mock direct examinations. 
Uh, and you know what's happened uh, during the course of the trial is yes, I would expect that the lawyers would be meeting with Mr. Mew after hours in the jail, kind of going through the day's events, talking about the evidence, and you know making sure that they are going to address every single thing that needs to be addressed. Eric, before we took that break, you heard uh, defense uh, counsel uh, attorney uh, Corey Turafisi there asking to dismiss the three attempted murder counts against uh, sort of the three lesser injured, though, as I pointed out, Riley Madison was badly injured uh, that, that, that on that day and spent several days in the hospital, surgery, diaphragm damage, but perhaps the two Carlson brothers lesser injured. Um, is that type of argument made in every case? You try to get rid of a couple of these counts or uh, did the defense really have a, a sound argument on, on those three specific attempted murder charges? Yeah, that type of motion is going to be made in virtually every single trial. It's called a motion for judgment of acquittal. Uh, the standard is such, as the court said, that they really have to, the judge really has to look at the evidence and the light most favorable to the state. Um, they have to take that into consideration and just say, is it fair to make a jury, you know, uh, consider these charges? Is it a valid argument? Sure, it's always a valid argument or potentially a valid argument. Um, I think you saw that the validity of the argument really applies particularly to the three lesser injured individuals because it really focuses on what was his intent. Um, but it also does give you a little bit of a preview as to some of the arguments that the lawyers are going to be making in closing arguments as well, which is you can look at these injuries and and on that basis alone that he didn't have the intent to kill those people. Mm. Eric, you and I spoke overnight about uh, the provocation component and there had been a lot of testimony back and forth in this trial about uh, Nikolai Mew and what happens between him and Madison Cohen. This is the woman, the blonde woman, Madison, however we, you know, you want to phrase her, her, her identity has come in different ways depending on who's testifying. But there, def, I mean, from what I've observed in the testimony, there's some kind of physical confrontation between those two, whether Mew hits first, she's in his space and puts arms on him question mark but why is that moment so important why is there so much attention being paid on the interaction between me you and madison and why should all eyes be on what he has to say about that encounter it's because the law in wisconsin as well as in minnesota does not afford an individual an opportunity to raise self-defense if they provoke the uh, confrontation. So who is the first aggressor or who provokes the, uh, the physical part of the confrontation becomes a critical point in this case as well. Uh, it could prevent Mr. Mew from getting jury instructions if the court were to find that he was the uh, initial aggressor. It could deprive him theoretically of the self-defense instruction. Um, I think the court has already indicated it's going to give the instruction, but that will become a very big part of the final closing arguments as well. Who provoked this? Who provoked this confrontation? Because if they, if the jury finds or the court finds that Mr. Mew was the initial aggressor, then he is not entitled to raise self-defense. The only way that he can revive his we are back on the record with the attorneys Eric, and we're Mr. Cut Mew. You off there. I appreciate that. Court. Stick around through the lunch uh, hour. Outside we're going the presence back of the, the jury. Nikolai Mew. Uh, Good afternoon from our Fox 9 uh, streaming center here for our Apple River stabbing trial gavel to gavel coverage. We have just seen uh, uh, the first portion of uh, uh, they're going to divide up the defendant's uh, testimony today. Nikolai Mew, you heard there. Uh, his defense attorney has about 15 more minutes uh, by his estimation. Uh, we'll do that after lunch. Uh, they're giving the jury lunch. They have some legal issues to talk about. Uh, and then obviously Nikolai Miyu will have to face uh, a, a withering, what we expect to be a withering cross-examination uh, from the state. They too have now waited two years to really have this opportunity. Let's bring in uh, criminal defense attorney Eric Nelson. Eric, uh, your first assessment on Nikolai Miyu and, and, and the story he is beginning to tell this jury. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the defense is doing a good job of doing a couple things. Number one, they're they're doing a good job of humanizing him, you know, putting him into the perspective as far as having the the heart surgery, that the the dog. They're making him uh, to be a sympathetic person, physically weaker than the uh, group of boys. Um, and what they're also working on doing is trying to delineate between 
memory issues, um, inconsistencies, lack of recollection versus out and out lies that he told. Eric, uh, Aaron, Aaron Nelson, no relation, right? I don't you're not related. Right. I don't think I've specifically asked you that question, but Aaron Nelson is a Miu's defense attorney doing the direct examination of him. He literally went, you know, got his name out. You're the Nikolai Miu, but then right into the confrontation with Madison Cohen. We've talked about this ad nauseum uh, in our coverage, but that just seems like the critical moment. And I think it was highlighted there. Uh, with that strategy, if your defense uh, counsel, is that what you're doing? You going right to that moment physically between Madison Cohen, Nikolai Miu in the river facing off with everyone yelling and screaming around them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an effective strategy. I think, uh, you know, they've done a lot of the character type witnesses by taking people out of order. Um, so they've able to really kind of establish a little bit more about who he is through his wife and friends. And let's just get right to the meat and potatoes of what we're here to deal with. And before I go back and play a little bit of the testimony, just quickly, the state is objecting a lot to the leading questioning. And, and, and the judge is um, uh, sustaining the objections as if Aaron Nelson, I don't know, I, I mean, it must be delicate to, 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 to elicit a testimony from your own client. Could you explain legally what we're watching there and what Aaron Nelson has to do to make sure his questions can get legally answered? Sure. Uh, because he's doing the direct exam, he has to ask very general questions. What happened? What were you feeling? Versus leading questions, which generally the defense is more accustomed to doing. Leading question, uh, the question itself implies or contains the answer that you're seeking. Um, so it is a little bit difficult as a defense attorney to kind of switch hats and go into a, a direct exam. Uh, and so that these are really just sort of technical objections um, you know, that the state is making and they're being sustained because they are leading questions. And again, before I get back to the uh, the soundbite on the witness stand from Nikolai Miu, I would just point out uh, at different points over the last few days of this trial, defense witnesses were taken out of turn. So there were some reasons why that's important and who gets to ask certain kinds of questions. So with that, let's go back. Nikolai Miu's uh, first uh, soundbite that we have queued up uh, from this morning's testimony. The noise became garbled. I mean, the, the sound became garbled. Did you feel threatened at that point? Uh, yes. Did you have your knife in your right hand? Yes. What did you do with your left hand? With Tell us what you did with your left hand. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, with, so with, with my left hand, I uh, pushed her away from my face. Can you show us what you did with your left hand? Why'd you do that? She was very close to my face. She was in my personal space. She has been, had been there for a while, and uh, I felt threatened. Were you, did you intend to harm her in some way? No. Did you try to harm her in some way? Absolutely not. Do you know where, if at all, you had contact with her body when you raised your left hand in that manner? No. And I know, Eric, sometimes you don't always hear the sound bite and the way our feed is set up, but he talked about the noise being garbled. Remember, he talked about how loud it had become and every the water's running and he couldn't hear everything. He felt threatened. He had the knife in his right hand. He had his left hand and I pushed her away from my face. I felt threatened again. Uh, the beginning there of his story about what he's doing is he sort of squared up with Madison Cohen. Right. Yeah, he's I mean, he is explaining a couple of different things here that are happening. Uh, one is a whole separate uh, analysis that I think the defense covered a little bit before in terms of the tunnel vision, in terms of what he saw and here. Um, it's really dipping in the, their toe into uh, the water of what we call force science and what happens to the human brain in a high stress situation. Uh, so you've got that kind of tail ended and then sort of that confrontation that initial confrontation and he's essentially what they're doing is establishing that Mr. Mew felt threatened or was beginning to feel threatened and used a moderate amount of force to just create a personal space that wasn't intended to be assaultive in its nature. I know I'm going to bounce around because there's just so much to unpack from that first half hour, but how important is his health? The fact he did the quadruple bypass, he feels lousy. He's just, you know, lucky to be alive as, you know, been on bed rest uh, and, you know, in the year or so before this. How important is the health component to, to what would transpire that day? 
It, it's important. I mean, it's it's not the primary you know focus, but it is important to take into consideration the things he's feeling, the things he's concerned about, the emotional response he's having to this situation. Again, because the jury instruction is so specific that the jury, when they're analyzing the testimony of all of the witnesses and all of the exhibits, they have to look at it from the perspective of Mr. Mew. And the jury instruction is very favorable to the defense in this regard. So that's why they're bringing a lot of these things that may seem trivial or may seem somewhat distant. But if that's what he's experiencing and that's what he's concerned about, uh, he, they want the jury to know that for sure. And I think one thing that is new, it's been hinted at during the testimony up to this point, but why didn't you go to the group, right? We've seen that video. He's kind of free and clear. Um, it, it picks up a little bit into, you know, the initial uh, contact with the teenage tubers from Stillwater, but he's definitely uh, down river, but he comes kind of marching back through the water. We now know he doesn't really like the, 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 the sandals he's wearing. They're all beat up. The, the riverbed is slippery. But why did he go back? You know, that, that I thought was sort of an important point. And I don't know if the defense purposely sort of left that sort of to be mysterious until this point. But he was clear today that the reason why he ran back is he thought he saw that lost cell phone, Ariel's lost cell phone. Remember, it's in the pouch. It goes, uh, it gets lost. He assumes it's down river. So he heads out uh, in his snorkel and goggles looking for that phone. And I don't know if it's the way Cockfield was holding his cell phone off the, you know, protective water bag lanyard, but he certainly thinks that the kids could have his cell phone. So, or, or his group cell phone. So he goes towards them. That, that makes sense, right? Uh, if he thinks there's something he's looking for, a valuable object, and then that the kids might be taunting him about that, you know, perhaps, you know, he's entitled to go back and look, but then as he gets there, he slips, and then all of a sudden that begins one of the first sort of steps in this kind of escalating confrontation that, that would then kind of blow up with uh, with Madison Cohen and Riley Madison coming over from the Carlson group. I'm just wondering, did, did you get the feeling like the defense kept that little sort of secret? Like, why did me you uh, run back or, or do you think that had been established enough and I just uh, sort of missed it? No, I don't know that it was an intentional effort on their part, um, but obviously a lot of the other witnesses wouldn't be able to testify about why Mr. Mew would have run or jogged or slipped uh, in their direction, why he approached them in, in, for any reason. So, you know, th th they would have not have the ability to say what his intention was at that point. This highlights again, you know, the importance of his testimony, right? Why did he jog? What was happening in that moment? Um, and what was his perception of these events? Uh, so I think they, the defense intentionally had to wait for Mr. Mew to explain those behaviors. And I think that they did a really good job establishing he was looking for the cell phone. The kid was holding a cell phone. He thought he was being you know, offered the cell phone that they had found on the rocks, drops the, drops the uh, snorkel and goggles. And, you know, then it just it escalates from there. We're watching the uh, video in, in the, the uh, side screen now, full screen here. But, uh, yeah, you then see the snorkel and goggles go under, and then the boys, you know, really start surrounding them and what the Carlson's impression, the Carlson group's impression of what's happening. I mean, a little step in this process, Eric, just escalates. And you can think of so many moments where both sides, you know, it did not have to result where it did. I'm just I'm curious. We haven't necessarily gotten to the point in his testimony. We know, you know, he admits to where he pulled it out, why he pulled it out, why that moment he pulled it out. Does he have to explain why he doesn't say anything, why he doesn't offer a warning? You know, if he cuts up and kind of holds up the knife, you know, I don't know. I mean, the perception of a juror could be no one's going to kill him right there in that river. But I've got a knife now. Back up. He, he doesn't do that. Uh, is that something? Will he have to explain what what he doesn't do in that moment once he pulls out the knife? I don't I don't know that he's going to have to explain why he didn't do uh, that, um, why he didn't give them a warning. The law doesn't require him to give a warning to use force. Uh, the law allows even uh, for a misperception of the potential threat to him. Uh, so he doesn't have to be accurate in what he's perceiving and viewing. I think it's I think this whole kind of chain of events right here really highlights uh, some of the issues that lawyers deal with with witness memory, witness perception. You know, you see him running towards this group. 
and to a group of kids it's a very strange you know strange reaction why is this grown man running towards us but it also puts it into perspective from from his uh from his point of view as well so you know the law doesn't require him to kind of give a warning or you know or anything uh he he pulls it out i think that's a clear sign he was feeling threatened Let's go back. I've got another soundbite queued up from his testimony in case you're just joining us. It's now 12:15 central time. We are on a lunch break. Uh, you might have heard uh, judge say they are coming back to discuss some legal issues at 12:45. We then anticipate the jury coming back at one o'clock. Uh, Nikolai Miu under direct examination, and then we would get to a state cross. Eric, uh, bear with me. We're going to play that soundbite uh, from this morning. Uh, Nikolai Miu um, testimony under direct examination uh, by his defense attorney, Aaron Nelson. I lied about the knife. Was that your knife? Yes, it is. It did, was. Did you bring it with you uh, when you went to go uh, look for the phone? Yes, I did. When you went to go look for the phone, did you have any intent to harm anybody? No. Why'd you go leave your group? To go look for the phone. Okay. At some point, did you have some contact with a, a group of uh, teenagers? Yes. Um, and you were here in court when we uh, saw the nine second video, is that right? Yes. I wanna show you just a, a couple of slides from that if I could. Do you, uh, do you see those slides up there? Yes. Are those from that video? Yes. What are you uh, doing in those three slides in general? I was scanning the water looking for the phone. Okay. And are you in that position, are you walking upriver or downriver? Upriver, away from, the, from that group of uh, boys. Did you hear them say some things to you? Yes. Prior to your walking upriver and them, uh, did you hear those words that I have written on that slide? Yes. Prior to your hearing those words when you were walking upriver, had you had verbal contact with that group? I think they, so. They asked me what I was looking for, and I told them I'm, I'm uh, looking for a phone, a lost phone. Did you ever tell them that you were looking for little girls? No. Were you looking for little girls? Absolutely not. It's pathetic. Um, when you, at the end of this, when you, you watch the video, at the end of the video, where I'm not going to play it, but do you remember what you did right there at the end? At the end, I was walking away. Okay. Did you eventually turn around and face in the direction of the group that was yelling at you and calling you a raper? Yes. When you... Yes. I'll sustain the objection. Uh, the question was leading. Please continue. What did you do at the end of the video? I, I was walking away. At some point, did you ever become in a position where you uh, were looking at that group of teenagers that had yelled at you? Yes. Um, 
what did you see when you were looking at that group of teenagers after the end of this video? I uh, saw them, I saw one of them holding a, a phone in a bag, um, and I believed it was what I was looking for, so I turned around and I started approaching them. Why did you approach them? I wanted to get a closer look at the phone to see if it was the one that, was, uh, that belonged to Ariel. And Eric, I, I hope you heard that one, but that was uh, part of the uh, testimony about lying about the knife. Uh, you know, he owned it there. And I lied about the knife. Uh, did you ever tell uh, the young men uh, what you were looking for little girls? He said, uh, no, that's pathetic. Seemed, you know, heartfelt, a, a legitimate response uh, to some of the, with the testimony that has come in that he was it said at some point, I was looking for little girls. Seemed to swat that away. And then... Uh, talk about uh, was walking away but wanted to get a closer look at the phone um, early you know he hasn't gotten under cross-examination yet we haven't gotten to necessarily the stabbing moments um, but so far uh, likable sympathetic what, what, what do you think the jury's making of, of just the way he's telling the story yeah I, th I think he comes across as uh, quite measured in his response I think he's coming across as a sympathetic uh, individual I think in that last clip that we just watched, what the defense is really trying to do is establish a couple of different things. Uh, number one is by indicating that he was walking away from the confrontation. Uh, he was uh, giving, uh, the, 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 the defense is establishing that essentially what, what uh, that the boys were the ones who continued the confrontation. So it's the whole question of the duty to retreat or whether there is any ability to retreat under Wisconsin law. Number two, what they're doing by talking about the, the slurs or the comments that the boys were making towards Mr. Mew is they're establishing that those words were confrontational. Uh, generally speaking, when we think about a confrontation, you think about a physical confrontation, but the law does authorize you know, some physical response to what, what the First Amendment refers to as fighting words. And uh, so you, your speech or your your ability to say things is tempered by uh, you're not allowed to use fighting words. Those are the types of words that are going to provoke an immediate breach of the peace. And by calling a grown man a child rapist, by calling him a predator, those are the types of things I think the defense is trying to illustrate as that could be considered to be the initial provocation. The fact that they followed him and that they were uh, continuing to use those types of words and descriptions uh, that could be considered an arguably the first provocation. Eric, I'm going to may throw you off a little bit here, but what does this case look like if we don't have the Cockfield video? It's a completely different situation. Uh, that video is uh, such an uh, instrumental part of the case. And, you know, I think that one of the missteps, if there's missteps on the part of the prosecution, is is attempting to kind of illustrate that this is not the entirety of the perspective of everybody and everything. Um, I mean, obviously the video has taken a front and center role. It's entirely important. If we didn't have it, it's anybody's word uh, and credibility becomes far more important uh, about who had the knife, whose knife was it, all of those things are far more important. But the video is gonna show uh, a lot and the, it's gonna be a very important piece for the jury to consider. I know right before lunch, uh, we listened in as the defense tried to dismiss three of the attempted murder charges against three of the lesser injured of, of the victims in the river that day. The judge denied uh, the motion uh, uh, at that point. I'm just wondering, I know I asked you this before the trial, could you get a scenario where uh, certain counts, uh, you know, we'll get to maybe uh, is, a, is a case appropriately charged, but could you get to a point where certain stabbings are justified by, uh, by self-defense, but others are not? Or do you see a jury sort of making an up and down decision? Because each count sort of rep it does represent the victim. The murder is Isaac Schumann, and then the four attempted murders are each individual stabbing victim, if you will. I know people, that's a, that's a weighted term, victim. But um, would you see an up and down verdict, or could you get one or two, yes, they did X, Y, and Z, provoking him more and then acquitting on, on some of the other counts. 
uh, you can see really any combination uh, in this particular case because there really are multiple issues. Uh, you could have uh, the jury decide in one particular with one particular alleged victim that it was not his intent to kill that particular individual. Uh, and in other with other victims, you could see that uh, they could say that, well, it may not have been his intent to kill, but the amount of force he used was unreasonable on the circumstances. So you, you can really have a mixture of any combination of guilty or not guilty in this particular case. Interesting. I appreciate that. Let me uh, go back to one more in case uh, some of our viewers may not, their streaming uh, viewers did not uh, get to see all of uh, Miu's testimony. Uh, we have another uh, portion of it queued up at several minutes. Uh, this again, really focusing on that encounter between Miu and Madison Cohen. Uh, we'll pick it up there. Do you remember what Madison did, if anything, to you? Yeah. What she, did she do? <clears throat> she grabbed my right arm and she pulled me towards her and I lost my balance, so I moved towards her. Did you consider that in that circumstance to be a gentle or a gracious touch? No, that was not a gracious touch. No, not at all. Had she been using any gentle or gracious words with you? Not that, no, not that I remember. Um, in those photos, can we see the footwear that you were wearing on that day? Yep, those sandals that we saw earlier. Did you have confidence in your footing in that area with those sandals? Objection leading. Sustained. How did you feel about your footing in that area? Very unstable. I uh, want to show you the next set of slides here. Uh, do you remember uh, what you say to Madison after she um, pulled on your right arm? Yeah, I told her not to touch me. And why did you tell her that? Because she pulled on me without my, uh, my invitation. Um, were you, did you say that in any particular tone? No, not in a mean tone, but I, I made it sound so she could hear me. Don't touch me. Okay. Why didn't you want her to touch you? I didn't give her permission to do so. Sure, but why did you not want to give her permission to do so? Because she was one mind, one track mind. She just wanted to get me away from that, point me down river and tell me to go there. What's your comfort level at this point? Um, <clears throat> on a scale from uh, one to, to 10, comfort level is very low. Okay. Are you, um, if you had that same thing, a scale of like a fear scale, a one to 10 fear scale, right? And yeah. so with 10 being the most fearful you've ever been in your life and, and zero, let's call zero to 10, being the most safe you've ever felt. Mm -hmm. Where are you at here on a fear scale? In that particular, uh, yeah. about one. Okay. So you're more uncomfortable, but not necessarily afraid. Is that what I understand? Correct. At, um, where was your group in relation to you then? Was up river. And did you do anything in order uh, in relation to your group? Yep. What did I, you do? I, I turned to them and I, I uh, called them. I was trying to call them to, to come over and help me. Is, are these slides, does this 2127, 2140, 2131, what does that show you doing? I was waving at them and calling them to, to come over. When you say you were calling them, did you do something physical or did you do something verbal or did you do both? Physical. Did you make any verbal comments at that point? No. Why not? It was very loud. All around me was very loud. I don't think that anybody could have heard me at a hundred and some feet away. With everybody else yelling, did you think your yelling was going to de-escalate or escalate the situation? Uh, when everybody's uh, 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 raising their voice, I don't think having another raised voice would help the situation. Eric, a couple quick questions out of there. Uh, the effectiveness of using that scale, the 1 to 10, 0 to 10, just to put uh, sort of his, uh, his feelings in that moment. Uh, did you like that? Sorry, I had to unmute. Oh, no, uh, oh, did you, you heard the question now. Yeah, yeah, I heard the question, sorry. Uh, 
it, it was a little awkward. I think it highlights some of the English to English as a second language type oh. issues. Uh, it was a little bit awkward. Um, I think they cleared that up with some follow up questions that were much more effective. Um, yeah. And then the other thing was just uh, the explanation why he didn't, why he wasn't more verbal or perhaps more, um, you know, engaging with trying to wave down his group that we now know is 233 feet away. I know he's using at least 100, but we've seen in some graphics that uh, and some models created by the uh, by the authorities who investigated the case that the Muse tubing group was more than 200 feet away, so almost three quarters of a football field away. Um, a uh, decent explanation. He didn't want to ratchet up the temperature there. Uh, he didn't think anyone would hear him. Uh, does that make some sense to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it does. I think it illustrates kind of a lot of what he was feeling in that moment and trying to put himself back into that uh, into that time. Uh, obviously, he had described kind of the the noise level, the volume of the kids yelling at him. He was concerned about that, and obviously, it, it could potentially escalate the situation into yet a even bigger confrontation. And and my final question for you before we take the lunch hour with all of you, and again, 1245, we'll be back in court for some legal arguments, one o'clock for testimony, so that's about a half hour away yet. Um, what does the state want to think about in terms of their strategy in cross-examination of the defendant? Right, they're gonna really focus, I think, on a couple of different things. Number one, they're gonna really wanna try to hammer on and focus on that Mr. Mew, if he felt so threatened, could have easily swam away. Like that's essentially, it goes to that whole, he had the ability to uh, disengage the situation. He's the adult, um, they can focus on that. Number two, and I suspect that we'll address, uh, the, they will go through and highlight every single lie that he told in his statement to investigators. Those are gonna be the focus on uh, the focus of, of what they're gonna be doing. What's a good answer for him? Why didn't you swim away? Why didn't you walk away? Why didn't you just leave? Who cares about the phone? Sure, I mean, he could have he could have said a couple of things. Um, you know, the, the water drops off. He didn't know if they were gonna gang up on him from behind. He didn't know uh, what was gonna happen. And so it was better for him to, to sort of stay facing the threat in a way uh, rather than turning his back to the threat. And I had one friend who I know is watching from afar, just uh, assessing everything. And it's just like, it's all human. Like we're hearing these questions asked one at a time and frame by frame, but what is the overall sort of takeaway as a human being that, that has a knife in, 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 in your pocket? you know, for legal reasons, for obvious reasons to go tubing. But eventually the jury does have to do that, right? They have to put themselves in Nikolai's situation, assessing everything, what's going on around him, the circumstances that he is trying to help a friend out and find a phone. Then all of a sudden he trips. Now he's missing his snorkeling goggles. Now he's got women in his face. They have to assess it from all of that, right? Uh, there is human emotion. Yes, there are questions and answers and screenshots, but at the end of the day, there's a human being in that body that makes these decisions. Right, uh, it, 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 we live in a very strange vacuum in the courtroom where we have the ability to break down what happens in frame by frame or second by second, you know, milliseconds even. Uh, I think that the, the crux of both sides closing arguments are really going to have to focus on the the intensity of the situation and bringing it back to how quickly these things actually happened. Mm. And you would anticipate, we've kind of texted back and forth, that we would see closings. It sounds like there could be a rebuttal witness or two. You would expect closing sometime tomorrow morning, correct? That's what I would uh, reasonably expect. I mean, I know judges in Wisconsin like to use every available minute. They don't like to waste jurors' time. But considering that they're ahead of schedule, well ahead of schedule at this point, um, given the, the fact that they're not going to want to have the jury deliberate late into the evening or at least give them an opportunity to come in fresh, I would expect it to be tomorrow. And that is Eric Nelson, criminal defense attorney here in the Twin Cities, helping us out uh, as we try to uh, process and make sense of what is an enormous day 
uh, in that uh, Apple River uh, stabbing trial inside uh, Judge Waterman's St. Croix County Circuit Court. Eric, thank you so much. Why don't you stick around and we'll see you later this afternoon. Uh, again, we are on lunch break for another 15 minutes or so before we see the parties in court. Uh, witness testimony, specifically the defendant, Nikolai Miu. Right. From our live streaming center here at Fox 9, uh, 237 Central Time. Uh, we have hit our mid-afternoon recess after a uh, blistering uh, cross-examination of Nikolai Miu on the witness stand. Uh, uh, we've, we've had a little bit of uh, some technical issues coming back to us here as we await the uh, uh, we're joined today by uh, our legal analyst, Eric Nelson, today via Zoom, uh, Twin Cities uh, criminal defense attorney. But uh, quite a lot to unpack here with, uh, with Nikolai Miu on the stand. Uh, uh, questions about why he was searching uh, for that lost telephone in the area of Isaac Schumann and the young tubers. I see Eric Nelson there on the feed. I hope we are clean and ready to go with that. Eric, I'm just wondering uh, your assessment. Uh, I thought Direct examination went well for me, you and his legal team, but now on cross, uh, it's tough to survive these questions. Yeah, absolutely. He's uh, taking some punches. I think the prosecutor is doing a really uh, good job kind of breaking it down second by second, uh, asking exactly what he's thinking, kind of using some of his own words against him and uh, doing a, a good job in that regard. Eric, let's go back. I, we queued up a uh, soundbite from, uh, from this cross-examination uh, as they go frame by frame and they show me you, uh, and he's got to answer these questions. He doesn't have any help. He doesn't have any protection. His defense attorney's objecting to some of these questions, but most of them are being allowed in the form they're being asked. Uh, let's go back. We have some testimony, and then we'll get your reaction on the uh, back side of this. You had been fidgeting with your knife multiple times. You've got Riley Madison in front of you. I believe her testimony was she's a 115 pound woman. You got Maddie Cohen on your other side. This is when you choose to pull out your knife, right? Question asked the form. Overruled. Understand the question? What does her weight have to do with uh, me? Sir, you don't get to ask the questions oh, at this point. Mm -hmm. You pulled out your knife at this point with these two girls standing in front of you, right? Yes. And you held it down by your belt, belt line, right? Yes. And you opened it up, right? Yes. And this is before you had been punched or anything like that. You had that knife ready with these two girls standing in front of you. Objection as to the use of the term girls and women. Women, pardon me. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you didn't hold it up and say, hey, I have a knife. Right? To me, that would be a threat. Well, I'm not asking you that. You did not hold it up. No. And you didn't, in fact, you held it down by your side. Right? Objection asked and answered. Overruled. Isn't that what you did? Yes. You didn't take a step back and brandish it and say, hey, back up, I have a knife. Right? Correct. You opened it down low, and then you held it down low by your side. Right. Correct. And as you're doing that, you're smiling. Right? That's not a smile. Well, let's take a look I'm, at the video. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And annoyed. That's you holding your knife down by your belt line, right? Yes. And Eric, I asked you that question this morning. Did he have a duty or a responsibility to, to hold up the knife, to, to sort of warn off uh, the folks around him? You said at the time he did not. So uh, I suppose that question isn't as damaging as, as it appears in real time. But uh, your reaction to that exchange? Yeah, I mean, he has no obligation, and I think he's probably legally correct that if he had brandished the knife, uh, it could have been clearly interpreted as a threat uh, on his part. Um, that being said, uh, I, the, the point is not lost, is that certainly someone who is feeling uh, threatened like that could have potentially averted 
uh, the, uh, the the escalation by kind of the proverbial warning shot. Who wins this thing if it becomes an issue of frame by frame? I mean, we saw on the other side, you know, you know Schumann's hands around his neck, uh, um, frame by frame. Uh, you know, who who wins? Uh, obviously, we've got to take the totality of the circumstances. But in these moments, if if the jury does want to isolate frames, uh, is that detrimental or helpful uh, to the defendant? It's really, it's really, really could go either way if you're going frame by frame. I mean, both sides can isolate a smile or a, a choke or whatever at any particular moment. I think that's going to be really imperative, especially for the defense, to kind of close this out by saying, "We, you as the jury, you don't get to analyze this second by second, frame by frame, when you're considering what Mr. Mew was feeling at the time. Right. So they're going to really have to hammer that home in their closing argument that he didn't have the luxury of a second by second analysis or a millisecond by millisecond analysis. They're going to have to really focus on how quickly this all came down in 22 seconds is the actual confrontation, as I recall. Uh, some of the notes I made, uh, the state pointing out that uh, he had never told anybody, nowhere in the evidence, did he ever say he stumbled before when he goes kind of r- running back to the kids and then and, and he loses his goggle and, and snorkels. I know they, they kind of jumped on him. That's the first time we ever heard you say you stumbled. There was some attention on his worn out sandals and the rocky uh, river bottom, uh, the, the isolating of him fidgeting with his knife even before the physical confrontation escalated. I, I pointed out where they, they turned that scale that they were using about fearful, you know, zero to 10, uh, how worried are you, unsafe do you feel, and then they use it as an anger scale. I think trying to, you know, goad him into, you know, I don't know, showing even some of that anger on the witness stand and then pointing out, of course, he is the only person with a knife out there. Uh, you would agree, I know you're a defense attorney and that's the, that's the hat you wear. You, you saw some sort of, uh, you know, wins in that, in the questioning uh, from the prosecution? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I mean, that is, they're, they're painting him as someone who was kind of, A, looking for a confrontation. When he first walks up, he's got his hand on the knife, according to them. Uh, you know, as, that, as it goes uh, forward, he becomes more fidgety with the knife. They're trying to portray him as kind of an angry person who sort of went looking for a confrontation despite warning from his friends. And I have another soundbite uh, from his testimony just in the last uh, half hour. So I'm going to cue that up. One thing I just wanted to share, because I know many of you are watching on our YouTube uh, stream, our live YouTube stream. And we've got thousands of you joining us this way for our gavel to gavel coverage, which we so appreciate. But we have taken a, a, an unscientific poll, no doubt. And we're, we're sort of, you know, it moves, the numbers moves or so forth. But uh, 22,000 of you have voted already. And uh, just again, uh, asking where you think uh, this case is headed. 51%, so more than half. Uh, believe Nikolai Mew at this point is, quote, not guilty, not guilty of the charges he currently faces. 35% say guilty, 14% uh, see a mistrial or some form of hung jury unable to to reach a verdict. So 51% at this point believe Nikolai Mew uh, is not guilty. Take that for what it is. It is unscientific. But those of you watching on our YouTube stream, we appreciate you and just wanted to share those numbers as uh, now let's go back into court, uh, Eric, and I will uh, get your reaction to, to, to this exchange here. You've never said that before today, ever, to anybody, any law enforcement or anybody else. Right? But I have seen the videos now. Well, we're going to take a look at the video. And since you reviewed the video, you know that before you ran up on them, you were touching your knife in your pocket to make sure it was there, right? I don't remember that. Well, let's take a look.
that's you with your right hand touching your pocket where your knife was clipped in, right? It appears so. What is he on? Whoa! 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 Get away! So you're claiming today that where you reach down and grab at these boys' legs, where their tubes are, that that was a stumble. Is that your story? Objection. Overruled. You can answer the question. I, I, I know I hit a stone, yes. But I, I, I grabbed onto their uh, uh, inner tubes. And you know where you grabbed onto their inner tube is where two of these boys had their legs draped over their inner tubes, right? I see that. And you made contact with their legs, didn't you? I don't remember that. Did you see it on the video? I see it on the video. I don't remember actually making contact. And as soon as you did that, these boys jumped out of their tubes to get away from you, right? You remember that? Yeah. And you held onto their tubes so that their tubes couldn't float away. For how long? Well, I'm asking you. You did? Yeah, it looks like for a brief one second. And you were searching through their tubes. Or what? You walked around their tubes. Rather than letting their tubes go so they could get back in their tubes and be on their way, you walked around their tubes. So after my goggles dropped in the water, I went around their tubes to go to the other side and look for, for, for my goggles. What do you think of that exchange there, Eric? I think it's uh, it's exactly what the prosecution is trying to do here is is making him you know putting his hand on the knife in advance, um, kind of being uh, someone that was in some way deserving of of being called names and questioned what his intents were. What are you doing right now with your client? Uh, there's this break. I assume. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't assume anything. I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, Mew is in custody, so he may be, you know, escorted into a side room. Uh, are Corey and Aaron meeting with him right now, either calming him down or, or sort of, you know, preparing him for what, what what's ahead? Yeah, I mean, I would expect that that is exactly what's happening. Is that they're reassuring him, they're telling him, you know, stick stick with it, uh, you know giving them their thoughts on how he's doing. Um, for sure, that's what's going on. You heard the state say at the very end, they still have a lot of questions left for him. You know, the judge asked if now is a good time to break. They say they have a lot more questions. Again, going frame by frame, and, you know, at some point, do you make, uh, do you make your point? Uh, do, does the state run the risk of beating up on this guy and making him more symp sympathetic as a potential victim here? Should they be thinking about a line that they want to walk up to with their questioning yet to come? Yeah, I mean, you definitely have to take into consideration two things. Number one, this is really the state's first opportunity to ask him these questions. They haven't had two years to prepare what he's going to say and how he's going to say it. Uh, so, you know, the, you've got to give the state the leeway to uh, to cross examine him and to thoroughly and effectively cross examine him. At the same time, you know, the, the you know, you talk about your poll there, Paul, uh, ultimately the only votes that count are the 12 jurors in this case and they're in the room they're getting the sense and they're going to feel a particular way for everyone involved uh, so you as a prosecutor or a defense attorney run the risk of going too aggressively against someone and actually having an uh, the opposite intended effect which is to make him seem more sympathetic and we are seeing a little bit of movement so i might have to cut off the answer but i, I didn't i don't think i got the legal explanation from you uh, as we headed into this break, but about these objections, um, Aaron Nelson is citing bad form, argumentative. Uh, from what you can tell and listen into, is the judge making the right call and allowing most of these questions, or do you see some that the state is legally uh, kind of uh, on the edge of uh, asking bad questions in that courtroom? No, I think I think the judge is getting the rulings generally pretty spot on. Uh, their form type objections. They're not the types of things that are ultimately going to be, uh, you know, a basis for an appeal necessarily. Uh, it couldn't just be a defense strategy to kind of uh, slow things down for the client as well. And here is Judge Michael Waterman on the bench. I, I do have several more questions. I could talk to you all afternoon, but let's uh, listen into the final afternoon testimony today. Nikolai Miu on the